Hi everyone and welcome to my booktube channel Lisa in Bookland. Today I'm here to bring you my June reading wrap up. I had a great reading month in June. I think I read 13 books. Um, June also felt like a really long month I suppose in a good way. Looking back at these books I couldn't believe that some of the books I read were in the same month like the ones I read at the start of the month and the ones that I end, uh, read at the end of the month. With that uh, onto the books I suppose. So the book that I read that's set like earliest in history um, is Sharp's Company. So this was a, a pure comfort read. I just needed some cheering up one day and I reread this book and it was one of my favourite Sharp books in my original read of the series. And this time I still really, really enjoyed it a lot. Um, but I would say because I'm reading them in publication order this time, I didn't find this book as impactful as it was the first time. Um, like what happens to Sharp when, when my first read, I thought it was like so unfair and I was so outraged <laughs> in this book. Um, but then when I um when I suppose when you're reading them in uh, publication order and you haven't read as many books with him already and you don't know him as well it, it didn't hit you quite as hard but still a really really excellent book um and it's such a book like about loyalty really um so yeah a highlight I think of the Sharp series still the next book I'm going to talk about then is actually a classic. That's Little Dorish by Charles Dickens. Um, so it's my kind of goal for the second half of this year to read one Victorian classic every month. And this was the one I picked for this month. So the Little Dorish of the title lives in the Marshalsea debtors prison where her father is imprisoned for debt. Um, she's very diminutive in stature as you can see from the cover there. She's quite short. That's why she's always called Little Dorish. Her real name is Amy Dorish. E even though she lives in the prison and she was actually born there during the day she's allowed to go out and she actually works to support her father in the prison and the rest of her family um i really really loved amy and i loved uh, reading about her um and i suppose the kind of disappointment of this book is that amy got like le less page time than i would have liked because i was enjoying her character so much and even like her family like her father you kind of uh feel sorry for him and hate him at the same time or her sister is really fascinating um but there's so much else going on in the book that she kept like getting dragged away into these like side side parts or like i suppose the more kind of social criticism -y parts and i'm like oh you're just trying to do, you're just trying to race through the book and get back to amy and um, that was especially apparent for me i think in the second half of the book so i'd say i enjoyed the first half more um it's still a good book. I didn't think the mystery aspect was as compelling as the mysteries in his other books, like the mystery in Bleak House, such as my favourite Dickens that I've read or Our Mutual Friend. Um, it was kind of like a bit rushed, tied up at the end, I think. And and how it was tied up at the end, although it was good, it actually the um this edition actually had an appendix at the end explaining the tie up of the mystery because obviously obviously the uh the editor didn't think that the type of the mystery was clear enough in the book itself. I did enjoy the romantic relationship that Little Dorrit had in this book. I thought it was really well developed. And um, like I suppose I did enjoy this book on the whole, even with all my criticisms of it. Like um, Dickens is very kind of hit and miss for me, but I often find I prefer his books on a reread and um, because there's so many characters kind of when you know them already or even remember them slightly going in um you can pay more attention to like the social criticism parts and you kind of know more what to expect um so i realize i say this and lot about an awful lot of books but honestly i am a big rereader and i do like rereading and especially books like this that I, I i i liked on the first go round they can improve a lot on a second read so yeah that's my thoughts on little dorish i am really glad i've taken up this pro taken up this project though and i'll be keeping going for the rest of the year so the next book I'm going to talk about is actually a book that I did a full review of and it's my favourite book and it's the first of three Natasha Pulley that I've read this month and that's The Kingdoms. Um, so it was actually my birthday at the start of the month and it was kind of uh, near to a bank holiday weekend so I spent the June bank holiday weekend rereading this wonderful book and I enjoyed it just as much this time. I won't, I won't say any more about it because I do have a full review which I'll link down below um, which I go into detailed thoughts and the first few minutes of that book of that review are, are spoiler free um so yeah I'd 
highly recommend this book, The Kingdoms. It's still my favourite Natasha Pulley. And um, yeah, really started off the month well. So when I went into the second uh, Natasha Pulley book that I was expecting to read this month, it was for a read along that was hosted by Katie from Books and Things. And that's uh, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow by Natasha Pulley. Um, I had huge expectations going into this book because I just reread The Kingdom. Although I still did really enjoy it and uh, Natasha Pulley's writing was just as good and everything I wanted it to be. I was a little bit underwhelmed by this book. Um, I It's hard to really pinpoint why. So I should say first of all that this is a sequel to The Watchmaker of Filigree Street so I won't say anything specific about the plot just not to give that away. So I really did enjoy uh, revisiting this world and the characters. Like I love Thaniel, the main character, and the other characters that are with him. Um, the relationship that followed up from the watchmaker of Filigree Street was explored really interestingly in this book. And I liked the twists that that took. Like, but my expectations probably were like artificially high. And like, is it possible to, while enjoying the Japan setting, also miss the foggy Victorian London setting that was done so well in the first book? Um, maybe, maybe not. But it, um, also, I suppose I missed some of the characters that were in the first book that weren't in this book. Um, like the policeman, I can't even think of his name now, but I, I really enjoyed him as a side character in The Watchmaker, so I missed him here. Um, a special shout out for the extremely graphic moth scenes that were in this. I have a phobia of moths, I'm absolutely terrified of them. It's a good job I read those sections like outside in the daytime, so I didn't need to have nightmares about them. But on the whole, like this was a really solid sequel and I will be looking forward to rereading it. Um, so yeah. I'll talk about the last Natasha Pulley book a little bit later because it's set in like the 1950s. So next is kind of into the 20th century and I read this was actually the first book I read this month and that was uh, The Key in the Lock by Beth Underdown. Um, it's an awful pity that I spilled an entire bottle of water in my bag <laughs> when, when I also had this book inside it I've rather ruined the pages but all the same, I really, really enjoyed this book. I also love that I bought this in Cornwall in Falmouth and I uh, and it's actually also set there, so that was just nice. And uh, just a second, I suppose, for this cover, it's the outside border of it is kind of set up like a Cluedo board, which is such a clever idea for, for, the, for, for what the book is based around. There's kind of two timelines. The first timeline, I think, is set uh, sometime after the First World War, and then the second timeline kind of in the past is set in the 1890s when the main character Ivy was a younger woman and um, what I love is that the two timelines they're, they're told by the same character like I don't always love uh, dual timeline stories but I really thought it worked really really well here and the in the current timeline she's married to a certain man and in the past she's kind of a much younger woman and um, so it's really interesting to see how she gets from A to B and it's really really like a first rate mystery like the different characters these one of those kind of nearly locked room mysteries which is fascinating um i love ivy's kind of social position so she's the doc she's the daughter of the local doctor and um, so she like helps her she helps her father with his work she can talk to the servants uh, in the big house where like this fire is taking place but also she can talk to the to the family of the house and kind of get the scoop on both and i think they're the best characters to follow in historical fiction they're definitely um the most interesting looking at those kind of characters is nearly like reading about ourselves i suppose in the past <laughs> if that's not too weird a thing to say like you know obviously we don't have servants anymore but you can talk to it's more socially acceptable to talk to everybody in all walks of life today so yeah i really really enjoyed this book and i'll definitely be looking out for more by this author beth underdown so would highly recommend the next book then is A House of Footsteps by Matthew West. This, I suppose, is kind of similar to A Key in the Lock, as in it's set in a big house in the country, but it's very different in many ways. Um, so it's kind of set again in like the post-war period, and this uh, man called Simon, who's like, lived much of a kind of idle life up till now, um, 
you know got he has a degree in art history and he kind of just enjoys life he actually goes gets a job to look at the the art collection that's in this old house um that nobody has seen from the public for years and living in that old house is this is the master of the house and his butler and the house is kind of a bit dodgy seeming i suppose it is kind of unusual that the main character in this book is a man like um books like this tend to be about women which is fine too but it was a little bit uh it was it a little bit of a different element I suppose. Um, so I enjoyed this book without it completely blowing me away. I loved the emphasis on kind of like the art and I won't spoil anything but kind of the nature of the art collection in that house. I just thought it was so creepy and well done and it was just it kind of disappointed me then when later on in the book he kind of got distracted from the art by something else that I was much less interested in um and that kind of was frustrating because the start of the art was like set up so well um like I don't know where else he could have gone with it but I I just I suppose I wanted more of that yeah it was still a good read so the next book I'm going to talk about then is another classic, more of a 20th century classic, and that's The the Homemaker by Dorothy Canfield Fisher. Um, so it's a Persephone classic. It was published in 1924, and I had it on my TV or even before I owned a physical copy because the premise is so interesting. Um, so the whole premise of this book is, for various reasons, uh, the man of the house, Lester, is unable to work and his wife has to go out and work instead and earn the money. And they actually find out that they're way more fitted for those roles, the man being the homemaker and the woman going out to work. Um, which is like incredible for a book that was written in 1924 and I love this like line that it just gives them the French flap somebody comes into the house and they see Lester is darning his own stockings and then they're like oh Lester let me do that the idea of your darning stockings is dreadful enough you're having to do the housework Eva darned them a good many years he said with some warmth and did the housework why shouldn't I he looked at her hard and went on do you know what you were saying to me? You were telling me that you really think that homemaking is a poor, mean, cheap job beneath the dignity of anybody who can do anything else. So that really sums it up. And while I did enjoy um, following Lester as he got used to being at home, um, I found the plot of Eva, like you get to see her perspective as well. And there's so many perspectives in this novel. Um, I loved her going out to work and kind of seeing how fulfilled she was by her job and how successful she was. Eva it did seem a little bit like a satire at times but in fairness I don't think it was really a satire of Eva I think it was a satire of kind of consumerism on a whole so you do get loads of different perspectives as I say including the characters bosses at work and also the children <laughs> just I suppose it's a pity I, I was actually much more interested in the older children but did focus quite heavily on the younger child um, who I didn't uh, enjoy as much and the bits on child rearing at the end did get a little bit like long-winded for me I did look up some criticism and apparently like the the author Dorothy Canfield Fisher was like a big proponent of the Montessori method of child rearing. Um, I I don't know anything about that, but um, maybe that explains it. Maybe she was just trying to, maybe that was just something she was really interested in. But on the whole, really really enjoyed this book. The in, the ending was very interesting and got me like thinking. Do you know? How what would happen today if that was the same if the same thing happened that happened at the end of this book and like have we moved on at all and it's, it's kind of sad to think that we possibly haven't moved on um do you know so it was just an interesting uh, thought I suppose. So the next book I'm going to talk about is perhaps predictably my favourite book of the month and probably will be one of my favourite books of the year and that's The Half-Life of Valerie Kay by Natasha Pulley. Um, it's her new release, it came out earlier this month. It was the first book since Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows that I pre-ordered. I know I should do that more and I definitely enjoyed the experience this time so I will probably do it more. It came in the post on the Thursday and I and I started reading it on the Friday and yeah I read it over that weekend. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, so it's set in the 1950s in the Soviet Union. At the very start the character called Valery, the former nuclear specialist and he's imprisoned in this gulag in Siberia. He gets pulled out of there by an old university colleague to work with them on this somewhat mysterious project in uh, in a secret location where they're studying the effects of radiation on this environment. 
I absolutely loved uh, this perspective. Valerie does believe in a lot of the aspects of communism and the other main character in the book is a KGB officer. The, all the discussion of uh, nuclear energy and radiation sickness, extremely, extremely interesting. It did bring back some of my leaving cert physics that I thought was forgotten. Uh, I think it explained it in a really, really interesting way. Um, even if it is a bit disturbing to think of what uh, radiation can do. What's most striking about this though um, is it goes into it in the afterward. It's actually based on real events and a real city in Russia today. Um, so that was eye-opening I suppose the afterward and I, but I wouldn't recommend you read that until after you finish the book just so you don't get any spoilers as tempting as it is. So I suppose what I loved about this book um which is a strange thing to say when I love the kingdom so much but I love that there's no like fantastical elements at all in this book um I think any kind of fantastical elements would have completely ruined it like that's what's amazing about it that it is all um that it is all just um nuclear science which you know is mind-blowing at times as ever i loved the characters in this book and i loved like, the relationship in this book i thought was the favorite i my favorite i've read in natasha polly's writing i thought it was the most equal relationship in a weird way um but yeah it was fabulous and the car and again i loved valerie i loved uh, reading about him i thought the female character anna in here was a big improvement and i really liked her as a character as well um so yeah i'd highly highly recommend the half-life of valerie k maybe if you didn't like the fantastical elements of of uh of natasha polly's other books but did enjoy the characters or her writing like the writing in this book again was stunning um yeah it's it's what it's one to maybe consider so yeah that's a brilliant book and i'm sure i'll be talking about it many times again so the next book I'm going to talk about I actually read on ebook and it's actually just a short novella and that's A Foster by Claire Keegan. And the reason why I read this was um I went to see the film that's being very highly rated in the cinema on Colleen Kewen, which is Irish for the Quiet Girl, um, which is based on this book. So I suppose the summary of the book and the film is that um this uh, little girl, I think she's possibly about 10 is, is from quite a big poor family in rural Ireland and because her mother is about to have another baby she gets sent to live with her mother's cousin and her husband who have no children and live all by themselves down in Wexford um, or Waterford in the film it was weird that they changed that but anyways and it's just a really quiet book it's about how she gets the chance to flourish when she's in that new environment and she gets a little bit more care man and woman in the book Mr and, Mits Mr. and Mrs Kinsella are uh, how she helps them out as well and with the secrets they have in their past um so although I enjoyed the book and Claire Keegan's writing is beautiful it was a bit weird because I read the book after the film I know <laughs> probably best to do it the other way around but um the film did add extra aspects that I thought were really really good like you know because it's only a very short book um I think it's like under 100 pages. The film obviously is like full feature length. So the film actually added in a few more things. And I think it was just such a good, it just shows what a good adaptation can do. Um, so they, what I loved about the film was they incorporated the Irish language quite a good bit and like obviously had subtitles but I thought that added a lot to the film. So just the story the line they had with like Mr Kinsella um, in the film it took him a while to kind of warm to the presence of the girl in their house and I just loved seeing that relationship develop and I kind of missed that in the book but um, yeah so I'd highly recommend the book if you get a chance to, it's probably gone from the cinema now but it's well worth a watch. It's a very quiet film, like relatively low budget, I'd say. But um, yeah, it just shows what you can do if people are to have the passion to adapt, uh, adapt a book properly. What was nice about that film is there was like I don't know there was probably about six of us in the cinema, and uh, do you know I it was so impactful that people actually stood outside the cinema door afterwards and talked about it with complete strangers, which I've never seen happen before. So um, yeah, that was a nice little memory for on Colleen Kuhn or Foster, as the book is called. So the next book I'm going to talk about I read at the start of the month as well and that's uh, The Slow Worm Song by Andrew Miller and um, so I was excited to get this to this book because I have read uh, two of Andrew Miller's previously previous books um now now we should be entirely free and pure and I enjoyed those two but I really really enjoyed this one as well 
I'd say it was probably my favourite and I, I really enjoyed Now We Shall Be Entirely Free so that's saying something but I think I enjoyed this one even more. It's about this ex-soldier that served in the Troubles in Northern Ireland and now he's back at home in Somerset um, where he, he's trying to repair I suppose a very damaged relationship with his daughter and while he's doing that he gets sent this letter um, from kind of a group that are doing an inquiry into an event that he was involved in in the Troubles um, and asking to like come back to Northern Ireland to testify. Like the first thing I say about this book is it's completely not what I was in, in not what I was expecting like it's not a courtroom drama or anything like that. It's very much kind of a character based book about memory and trauma and guilt and like recovery and if that's possible um isn't it funny like it's very kind of literary fiction I suppose I'd call it but isn't it funny you think you don't like literary fiction until it's about a topic that you're interested in and then all of a sudden it's like the best book ever so I suppose that was a lesson for me as well like the characters are written so compassionately I love the way this is uh, written so I think it's I, I was reading an interview um that he did with Irish Times and apparently it's the first book that he's written that's written in the first person and um, usually I prefer the third person but the first person worked really well well here because the whole book is written as a letter to his daughter um you know so it's kind of a bit wandering as letters can be and I just thought that was such a kind of intimate perspective I, I was equally interested when he was talking about when he was um talking about his experiences in the army back in the days of the troubles and when he was just go describing a lunch he'd had with his daughter um you know which was a rare thing that you enjoy both uh both strands of the story I love that he was a quaker i don't think i've ever read a book about a quaker before and just yeah to learn more about that i suppose was was interesting I thought The Troubles is handled really sensitively and um, I thought it was a great portrayal, obviously a difficult issue to tackle when it's so recent um, and from a difficult perspective I suppose but even the events that they're talking about they were described so carefully. The ending was a little bit open-ended I suppose, I don't want to give any spoilers but the last line, which I, I can't say because it's kind of a spoiler, the last line was so so good. I think it's one of the best last lines in a book I've ever read so yeah. So a bit different, I suppose. The next book I read, and isn't it funny, I don't know if you noticed from the thumbnail, but I tend, all of the books I read, a lot of the books I read this month seemed to be kind of turquoisey coloured or green or blue. That wasn't intentional at all. It was just, uh, I just noticed at the end when I was stacking them up. But anyways, the next book I'm going to talk about is Metronome by Tom Watson. So it's the premise of this book that really made me pick it up. Here there are two people on this island that have been put there for doing something wrong in their for committing a crime in their past and you don't find out what that was so the book just follows those two characters and kind of and the impact that has on their relationship and kind of just their everyday life it's weird because it was a really gripping book but also like not a lot happened at the same time so it's a bit strange like that but um like what was so interesting is like they're on a really big island but because they have to take this tablet every eight hours and like the pill is only dispensed every eight hours, like they can't stockpile it. Um, they can only see so far around the island. So they don't know a lot of the more distant parts um, or they can't, you know, try to escape. And um, that was so, so fascinating. So the ending was a bit weird. Like I suppose I, like, I would have liked a little bit of a neater ending, but it was, it was a good book. It was more of like a thrillery type book, but um, yeah a good read. The next book is actually the final book I read this month and that is The Last of the High Kings by Kate Thompson which is the sequel to The New Policeman which I read during the Irish Readathon in March earlier this year. Um, so I remember I read this once before when I was younger probably when it was originally published and um, I enjoyed it but like not as much as The New Policeman and although I couldn't remember what happened um, what happened when I was reading it this time I would say I felt the exact same um, like this is a solid children's book but nowhere near as uh, nowhere near as magical or as charming as The New Policeman which it would you know was again one of my favorite books of the year I'd say I kind of missed the there was less about music in this book and less there was set in kind of I don't want to stop, spoil The New Policeman but there was less there was there was less of the story that was set in the alternative location I did love the Pukas antics I uh, don't talk to any white goats they're bad <laughs> and what he did with the tree um but and the Liddy children, so I should have said at the start, this book is kind of set in rural uh, Galway, it's set in Kinvara, and 
And this follows uh, JJ, the same character from The New Policeman, but this time he's all grown up and he's married with children. Uh, he has four children. And I know that the children were really, really, I suppose it's the children's book, so the emphasis was on them, but I thought that she, I thought the children were written really well and had all, how they were all a little bit different from each other. I liked that. So loved Ashling, um, JJ's wife. JJ maybe a little bit less, and JJ and Ashling, I think, maybe aren't fantastic parents, <laughs> especially with Jenny. Uh, Jenny I suppose is the the bit of an unusual child in this book, but um yeah the way <laughs> I, I think they maybe need a few parenting lessons. Yeah, it's the second book of the trilogy, so I probably will finish the series just for the sake of completion. But um yeah, I think if you just read the new policeman and don't read read any further, you definitely haven't lost anything. The final uh so the final book I'm going to talk about then is another children's book, and that is uh, the Trials of Morgan Crow. Um, which is the first book in the Wondersmith series and I really really enjoyed this book I read it near the start of the month again but um, it's kind of about this child called Morrigan who's uh, who's under a curse that she's going to die on I think it's her 11th birthday um, and you know she's lived with that knowledge all of her life and how she can escape that destiny and um, so I loved this book it was so fun and so charming I love the relationship between like Morrigan and her friends I, I thought Jack's storyline was really good his ambivalent relationship with Morrigan I have heard that some people like say it's a bit similar to Harry Potter and there definitely are a lot of similarities but that didn't really bother me I just thought they were kind of funny and it was uh, it was fun to spot them I love the resolution at the end, I suppose, to the mystery aspect. I thought it was really satisfying and like one of those ones where I feel like I should have seen it coming but didn't. Maybe I'm just really oblivious. But um, yeah, I definitely will continue the Wondersmith series. So, oh, it's actually not called Wondersmith series. It's called the, called the Nevermore series. But yeah, can't wait to read more books written in that universe. So that's it. That's all of the books that I read in June. Um, do let me know if you've read any of these books. I'd love to know um, or what you read in June. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next Thursday for my next video.